and the critters that live there. So I'm going to share my Kahoot screen. And so right now you see that we're at kahoot.it and then you put in that pin number. So I'm going to give you a couple more seconds for those of you that are new to Kahoot. I see Caden just joined. Um, let's see a couple other people to join so we can play the Kahoot quiz game. I don't, I'm not supposed to play, right? Aiden will definitely win. Ooh, there's some mystery child person. <laughs> Is that my child? That might have been my child. Uh, so right now it's Caden versus mystery child. So once again, um, if you um, unminimize or unmaximize my screen. Oh yeah, there's Jeremy, go there's Jeremy. Jeremy. So you're gonna have a Zoom screen and you can have your browser open so you can see my, you need to see my Kahoot screen that I'm sharing through Zoom right now. All right, Teresa joined too. And Wendy, okay, people are getting the hang of this. Hey, oh, oh, they're all coming in, Kahooters are coming in. Okay, so we're gonna get going with Kahoot. The first um, screen we're gonna go to, the first question we're gonna go to is just a practice question. And so the idea is you'll see my screen, it'll pose the question, and then you answer it on your browser that you opened up at kahoot.it. So once again, you look at the Zoom screen, which will have the question, and then you're gonna answer it on your own browser. So here we go. Here comes the Tide Pool quiz. And the first question is a practice question. Which space shows a Tide Pool? And now you just click on red, green, or yellow, or blue. I see five people have answered. This is just our practice question. You all got it right, congratulations. But there was no points associated with this round. You guys ready for the next round? Here we go. It's a full on tie. Quiz question, which one of these animals can cut you if you handle it wrong? The octopus, the anemone, the jellyfish, or the salp? Ooh, it's a tougher one for folks. They're thinking about it. You have eight seconds left. Seven, six, five. Pick something quick. Four. All right. Oh, so that one... was actually the octopus. That was correct. I must have used Kahoot wrong to show you who won. Um, but the octopus, we're going to learn about that later. It has a nasty beak and it can cut you. Okay, next question. True or false? Crabs can regrow their pinchers if they lose one. True or false? Oh, so four of us got it correct, or three of us got it correct and four did not. And Kristen has a story about crab legs <laughs> getting ripped off. We'll hear about that. Okay, here we go. Oop. Mystery child is winning. Caden's in second place. Here's our next question. Which animal is our closest invertebrate animal relative? Is it the sea star, the octopus, the chitin, or the tunicate? <laughs> and and I, bear, I just learned what these were yesterday when I was hanging out with Kristen. The orange thing is the tunicate. The brown thing is the chitin. The sea star is the sea star and the... Octopus is an octopus. Nobody got it right. Wow. Is that correct, Kristen? Is it truly the tuna kit? It's truly the tuna kit. Wow. Yep. That's our and it's in its in its larval stage, it actually has a vertebrae. It has a chordate. It's in the phylum chordata, as with all other animals. Whoa. Whoa. Amazing. <laughs> okay. Mystery child. Okay, a couple more questions. True or false? All tide pools are protected areas and it's illegal to remove anything from them. True or false? <laughs> There's baby Neli and baby Quincy. False is the correct answer. So some tide pools you can go fishing in. Some tide pools you can actually go and collect, um, you know, mussels out of them, mussels and things like that. Um, but we will tell you of the tide pools that we're going to introduce to you which ones are protected areas. Um, it might not be a great idea to over harvest in the tide pools, but they're not all protected. Okay, let's see. Up, oh, Teresa, you came up into second. 
and mystery thing is winning still. And okay. you do, if you do collect from the inner title, you need a fishing license. So you can't just go and do it. Which one of these sea anemones live in the sun? You all thought the bleached one was the sunny one. Kristen, tell us about the green anemone. So anemones get their color from a symbiont, just like coral. And so it's it's zooxanthellae. And so anemones that are in the light have this symbiont that lives inside them and they give it a place to live. And the, al the algae that's living inside it gives it the color and sugar. And so it's a it's a commensal relationship. And so that one that looks all bleached is actually just in a cave because it doesn't have any zooxanthellae because the zooxanthellae can't survive in the dark where the anemone can. Yeah, we tricked you with that one. <laughs> um, and Kristen, I cut you off before you said something about what you need if you're gonna collect in the tidal zone. Oh, if you're gonna collect anything out of tide pool. So if you want to go harvest mussels, you would need um, a fishing license to do that and you would need to make sure you're not in a protected area. So some, some tide pools are marine protected areas, you're not allowed to collect in those areas. Or state parks, you also cannot collect in tide pools that are near state parks. Okay, here comes our last question. Let's see how our scores are. Ooh, mystery child, Teresa's catching up to you. Here's our last question. Sea urchins have. You know, oh, and this is specific for purple urchins. So the purple ones, the different answer if it's red. So purple urchins. Just straight up guess, unless you're an urchin biologist. <laughs> and I, oh. There it is. Hey, look at that. You guys, the, whoever chose 100 years old, red urchins live to be 100, can live to be 100 years old. Purple urchins live to be about 75 years old. I just learned that yesterday as I was listening to a talk about urchins. I didn't know that either, so. Okay, thanks for playing Kahoot along with us. Let's see who the winner is. Da 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 da. AO. Third place, AO. In second oh, was, place, Teresa. Teresa. First place, this green kid. Is that my kid? Yeah. <laughs> and then runners up, Caden and Kahooter. Good job, folks. Okay. We're going to leave Kahoot behind. Bye, Kahoot. And we're going to come back to our presentation. Thanks for playing Kahoot. I've never played it before. All right get into full screen. So feel free to use the chat. Um, Kristen has loads of answers um, and scientific words. Um, and we are going to put this in full screen now. All right. So Kristen, take it away and tell us a little bit about tides and what tide pools are. Okay, so we did our little quiz and now I'm going to tell you um, some, some exciting information about tide pools. So tide pool creatures have to deal with tides. And so for anyone who hasn't spent time with ocean, tides are basically the change in water level. Um, and so this is a picture of Davenport landing at low tide. Um, and then next slide. And so what causes the tides? This is super cool. Tides are actually caused by the the sun and the moon the gravitational pull on the earth and so basically um oh can you see my pointer from here or you probably can't oh i could point for you you could point okay so you can see that bulge on the earth and so that bulge on the earth is actually the ocean getting pulled by the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon and so when the sun and the moon are in the same line when it's new the new moon or the full moon then you have more extreme tides are called spring tides. And when you have the moon at the first quarter and the third quarter, you have something called neap tides. And so the, the pool is, is basically not as strong because they're interacting with each other. And so you don't have as, ex as extreme tides. 
Um, next slide. And so basically the best time to go out and explore the inner tidal is during the new moon and the full moons. And you can get an app on your phone to see how the tides, what the tides are doing. And so here I, I printed out a tide calendar for the month. You can also pick them up at surf shops in Santa Cruz. They have tide um, calendars that tell you how the tide, what the tides are doing. And so you want to go tide pulling when the low tide is at 0.0, .0 or lower. Um, and also when the wave forecast is small, you don't want to go into the inner tidal when there's a big swell. So if you know people are surfing big waves, you don't want to go into the tide pools. And so the next really good tides that are happening are the 16th, 17th, and 18th. And you can see that you, the tides are in the evening. Um, yeah. And so, um, so this is for October. And then when we go into November, um, you can see that, you know, there aren't that great of tides the, the first week of November and then the, the 13th through the 17th, um, it's the new moon again and you have some really good low tides. Um, we're getting into negative tides, which is, which is amazing. And then again, for the full moon um, at the end of the month. Um, and then when you get into December, there's a really good tide series um, where you have low tides in the, at about 3.30 in the afternoon, they're minus 1.3, 1.6, which is really exciting. So that's like a foot and a half below the zero tide level. And so that's a really amazing time to go exploring. And there's also a really good series over um, the winter, winter break. And so if you don't know what you want to do over winter break when your kids are home all the time, I guess our kids are home all the time anyway. When you don't have school, you could go tide pooling. And I have found with this distance learning that anytime there's a good tide, we distance learn from tide pools. Yeah. Okay. I, I use this app and I have an Android phone and I just love it because it shows day by day like this or month like this. And you see where it bulges out. It shows these negative tides. And so I just look at this and then I go to my personal calendar and I just write low tide that whole weekend. Because you get this free, incredible show if you can go at a negative tide. If you can go at a negative one tide, it's the most incredible gift that our coastline is like saying, come check me out. And, and the way that there's sort of a seasonality for when the tides are. And so in the fall, you have low tides in the afternoon. Um, in the winter months, it switches to really morning low good low tides in the morning. In the spring, it's also in the morning. And then the summer are not the best tides. Um, okay, so what to wear and bring on your adventure. Um, you can be crazy and wear wetsuits. If you have little kids, wetsuits is the way to go because no matter what, children end up sopping wet in tide pools, even if you're being as careful as you can be. And so wetsuits are great, but if you don't have wetsuits, um, wearing rubber boots or shoes that you can get wet. Um, and then, you know, and just like, you never know, is it gonna be hot and sunny at the coast or cold and foggy? So sun hat, warm hat, sunglasses, sunscreen, snacks, water, um, and also bringing a small net um, in a container to put creatures in temporarily is fun. So you can see in the picture here, um, our boys are catching um, cancer antenarius crabs. Um, and yeah, and so, you know, you can catch things, you can stick them in a small bucket and look at them and then put them right back where you found them. Okay, so safety first. You know, the, the inner tidal is a wild place. And so I just wanna just remind everyone that you need to really think about safety. And so always check on wave conditions before going. Um, make sure that there's not a really big swell. I mean, when you hear small craft advisor on the radio, don't go tide pulling. But, you know, most of the time, low tide, there can be waves and you're, you're going to be okay. Um, you should know when the low tide is. So look at your tide calendar. If you know the low tide is at 3.30, you know that you can go down to that water's edge at 3.30 and then basically start working back up as the water's coming back in. Um, always be aware of the ocean. Um, waves come in sets and so so you could be down in the low part and there aren't any waves but then you know three or four waves will come in a set. So if you look down and the rocks are wet, odds are a wave will crash there eventually. So just be aware and always use your ears in the inner tidal. Um, if you hear a big wave coming, 
you know, just either get yourself secure if you think the wave might hit you or instead of running, because you never want to run in the inner tidal. Um, algae and bare rock and also black rock can be really slippery. So just be aware that you're walking in a slippery habitat. Um, when you see black rock, that's actually um, a microalgae film, cyanobacteria, and so that stuff is really slippery. Um, and you can touch anything in the inner tidal. Like the inner tidal is a place where you can touch things. Um, there aren't things that are poisonous, but there are two creatures that can hurt you. Crabs have pinchers and they'll pinch you because they think that you're a scary thing that's trying to eat them. And octopus um, can cut you. They have these sharp beaks and I'll show you a picture of that later. So if, if you're lucky enough to find an octopus, just watch it moving around. You probably don't want to pick it up. Okay. Um, so tide pool etiquette, um, please don't collect living animals and plants. These guys, um, and algae, these are creatures that live and we want them to keep living there. And so we, people do have effects on tide pools. So in Southern California, when you go to tide pools, there isn't much algae left and there aren't very many animals left because there are hundreds of people that go into the inner tidal and, and stomp on things and collect things. And so here in Northern California, Luckily, we have not made that huge of an impact. So walk gently because you're stepping on living creatures. You don't want to stomp in the inner tidal. Um, you can step on barnacles and mussels and anemones. You might crush some, but in general, they're really tough. They're, they're used to having waves pounding on them. Um, if you pick a creature up, put it back where you found it. Um, and if a creature is attached to the rock, don't pry it off. So um, in this bottom picture, you can see that snail that you can just pick up and you can look at it and see what the underside looks like and put it back down. Um, with the limpets, those guys are like snails that are just stuck on the rocks and you can't pick those guys up. So just let them do what they're doing. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, tide pool creatures have to deal with waves and the sun. These are marine creatures living at their upper physical limits. Um, and so this is two pictures of Davenport landing one day with a, the with a big swell, waves are crashing up. At high tide, the waves cover the whole reef, and then at low tide, the, 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 all the creatures are exposed. Um, and I mentioned this before, when you pick something up, you want to put it back where you found it, because a few feet in the inner tidal has a really different environment. And so, you know, you can see these zonation patterns in the mountains, and as you move further up the mountains, you the con conditions change so like you know you can be above tree line you can be in the pine trees you can be down in i don't know those riparian trees and if you took a riparian creature and stuck it up in the high alpine it's not going to survive the same is true as if you take a crab from this pool stick it up on the high on the rocks it probably will dry out and die before the tide comes back in so when you pick something up put it back approximately where you found it. You don't need to be super specific, but like you don't want to run somewhere else and put it down. You want to pick it up, look at it and put it back down. Um, yeah, and so tide pool exploration, it's amazing what you'll find if you get down low. And sometimes it's easier to crawl and wade than it is to walk. And so when you're out there, you want to get your head down there. You want to look at things because you will discover so many amazing things. So I'm going to take over for a while. This is why I love the tide pools. Just the, the diversity and the beauty of what you can see. You go out, the ocean uncovers all these incredible things and you just slow down. It's unlike any other natural area, the diversity in a square yard just is so much more than what you'd find just on a forest floor. I mean, I'm not talking about microorganisms in the soil, but I'm talking about these different types of creatures that you'll see. There's, so there's just so many surprises when you're out there. Um, I'm gonna stop my share and show this incredible video. <laughs> this, was, this blew me away. We were at Four Mile Beach and um, this is what we found. And this is um, Kristen's child, the young biologist. Um, and I wish he would have said in current siphon and ex current siphon, but he used kid terms. So here they go. <laughs> Oh, wait, the video's not showing. Can you guys see the video? 
Video's not no, showing. No, video's not showing. You're right. Okay. Okay, let's... now here's the video. Oh, video. He got to hear the words, but not the... Okay, here we go. That's its brain, that's its butthole, and you can stick it, your finger up its butthole, and then that's its little mouth. Wait, can I hold it? <laughs> Wiley Anatomy. That's its brain, that's its butthole. Are you serious? This is really something? Yeah, it's a fucking brain. That's something. its butthole. So, so that's a salp. That's a, it's, it's a, it's a pelagic tunicate, which means it's a tunicate that lives out in the ocean. And it basically just siphons water in one hole and out the other. And, and salps are amazing creatures. And we were lucky to find one. Um, and that creature was, it was not going to make it. I mean, it was probably already dead. They like to live out in the, out further in the ocean. That was the most incredible thing I found in the inner title. But yeah, they, they're, I think they're more drifters out in the open ocean. Yeah. Okay. So there are incredible tide pools all around where we live. We chose five to share because they're easy access and they're incredible spaces to look at. So we're going north to south. And this bit.ly, so bit.ly slash 2SCTHC2. If you want to write that down, if you want the map, there's a Google map I made of this image. Um, so we're going to visit with photos and descriptions, Pigeon Point, Greyhound Rock, where you can have dogs, Scott Creek, which is a marine protected area. Um, so you, it's more strict in terms of what you can do there. Um, and uh, Davenport Landing, you can have dogs. And then Four Mile Beach, that's a marine protected area as well. And I should have mentioned that Pigeon Point North, the part of the beach or tide pools that are north of the lighthouse itself. Those are a state are, park. Those are state park. Um, so I'll get this uh, bit.ly link in the chat in a bit, but let's take a quick tour of uh, some of these beaches. So we all know the iconic Pigeon Point Lighthouse and everything in the foreground are incredible tidal areas to explore. I've swam out to those rocks that are there. And at a good low tide, you can actually, there's often a land bridge and you can walk out to those rocks and explore them. They're, they're really magical. There are a couple of like small little caves that you go through to get out to those rocks. And so you can see the picture here. You just park at Pigeon Point and this is the south, southeast area. And then this is the north area. So really easy access because there's parking there. They and there's, there's a staircase that takes you down to the South Reef. Those students are pointing right down the south, down the stairwell there. And here is the stairwell to just show <laughs> how easy it is. And the stairs continue right down onto the beach. So, so if you want easy access, um, it's a really great space to be. Um, sometimes you also get wind protection at these spaces just because of the point structure that's out there. Um, moving down the coast, just south of Waddell, um, or let me go back to Pigeon Point. Kristen, what, you, you want to add anything about Pigeon Point since you um, gone there? No. Pigeon Point is, it's a great inner title and it's a really good place to find nudibranchs, which we'll talk about later. And so, um, and I'll mention that again. That was the number one question of uh, <laughs> folks was how to find nudibranchs. Nudibranchs. Really and Greyhound there. Rock is another really good spot to find nudibranchs. Um, yeah. So I'll so let this you... is Greyhound Rock. This is the parking lot. I just showed a picture how to access it really easy. You just park the hill in the background there. That's Waddell or Big Basin. So it's right before you get to Big Basin. So easy parking. There's a steep path. That's something to know that the path is pretty steep. So if you have bad knees or elderly folks, the, the path is pretty steep, but not a problem for 10 year olds. <laughs> Um, and when you get to the bottom of the path, you land at this incredible rock. This isn't actually the Greyhound Rock. This is like one to the south. Um, but around this rock, you can swim and wade and go in the caves that are underneath it and land bridges. Um, incredible. I saw my second nudibranch here with, with Kristen and the kids. Oh my gosh. And this is an amazing, amazing spot for nudibranchs. And we've seen maybe, I don't know, 10 plus species of nudibranchs in the pools here. Um, and you don't have to have wetsuits. There is a, a lovely reef that you can walk around in, in boots and, or tennis shoes. And once again, you can have dogs here. And we have found some fun rocks to jump off of too. So some of the little tide pools are pretty deep and you can do little mini cliff jumping. So lots of to explore at Greyhound Rock. Scott Creek, 
Um, this is a late afternoon, super low tide day. Um, this is how you recognize Scott Creek. It's the place, super easy access. You just park right on the side of the highway, often see kite surfers out there. And from above, um, you know, parking along the highway here. And if you go to the north, you can see the tidal shelf right in the edge of this picture. You go to the south um, and you can walk for a mile and hit different types of um, tidal. And the, the, north, the north access is always accessible. The south access, sometimes when the sand's out, it's, it's hard to get to the reef. That you, there might be a huge, yeah, it might not work to get to the reef. Yeah, we have gone when there's not a lot of sand and you see you have to climb up and jump down and wade through pools. So it's uh, more of an adventure climb. Um, so th this was when the sand was far out and so a lot was exposed. And so you had to do a little, little like crawling around on rocks, but th that's fun. <laughs> um, and that's the north side, um, which is easier to access. And this night it was like freezing out. <laughs> It's a but really cool thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if you go all the way to the end of Scott Creek to the south, um, you pretty much butt up right against Davenport Landing. And so this is kind of at the end and boys were quite excited to climb a huge rock. Um, and you can see you're right up against Davenport and that's the cement plant there. So Scott Creek, eventually, if you just walk on a super low tide when there's not a swell, and there is some sand, you could make it all the way to Davenport Landing, um, but you really wanna check conditions before you go. So Davenport Landing is the next space off Highway 1. There's Davenport Landing Road, there's parking here. There's like kind of a little park with a swing for kids and you can have dogs and there's a bathroom and the bulk of the tide pools that you'd be exploring are over here to the north. Um, and then just over here where those kids were standing is just right here. So Scott Creek eventually Scott Creek Beach, if you just walk south, you end up at Davenport Landing. It makes for kind of a neat adventure once again if conditions are right. So you really know about the swell and the sand. Um, I'll let you talk about Davenport Landing, Kristen, because this is your home turf. <laughs> yeah, Davenport Landing, it's great. The, the north, the reef to the north has great algal diversity, lots of really cool invertebrates. The reef to the south is also amazing. And the reef to the south is a very, um, if you're going to go tide pulling for the first time, it's a really high reef and so, and lots of cool cracks and crevices. So it's a great place to explore where you, where you can stay dry, but still see really amazing things. They weren't staying dry, but you get the idea. <laughs> yeah. So this is the North Reef. Yeah. And then the pictures I was showing you earlier were of the South Reef. Yeah. And at times, depending on the sand, um, we've had many great times just floating around in pools. Like the kids, once they find a pool, they can just like hang out in the pool for 30 minutes, just floating around and playing um, when, when the sand is out enough and more pools are exposed. And once again, you can have dogs at that beach. Um, at the end of the beach, when conditions are right, there is a little cave um, to check out, which is kind of fun. What I like about it is what you see on the walls of the cave. It's just filled with incredible mussels and barnacles and ur anemones and sometimes urchins. It's just incredible space. Okay, moving on. Um, Four Mile Beach, uh, probably the hardest one to access. You park four miles outside of Santa Cruz. Uh, at the Four Mile Beach parking lot. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. You, if you've never been there, you've seen the cars parking there on the weekends. It's a great surf spot. Um, but you have to walk like a good 10 minute walk down a dirt road. Um, and then you get to this marvelous, marvelous beach, um, which has tide pools to the north and tide pools to the south. And on low tides, you can walk all the way down to Three Mile Beach. So it's just lots of incredible things to explore. This is the parking area that you probably recognize this parking area once just like it along Highway 1. So four miles north of Santa Cruz is where you access Four Mile Beach. And um, this is going north, um, incredible tides. When we went here the last time uh, with the kids, we were, I remember just crawling and waiting a lot. Um, it's, the, this, is, this is a really low slippery reef. Something that's really cool about this reef is that there's a lot of giant kelp growing in the tide pools. And so you can actually see an entire um, macrocystis plant and nereocystis plant in the tide pools. And so it's, it's 
really neat. And you get a lot more of um, subtitle creatures in the intertidal at, um, at Scott Creek. And then this is the other side of um, the Four Mile Beach. Um, that's that iconic rock you see um, driving when you're driving south. On Highway 1, you see that big rock jetting out of Four Mile Beach, and this is on the south side of it. And I was just impressed with the amount of these like boulder-like tidal features that were just sticking out of the, the low tide area there. Um, Kristen and the boys went out farther to explore some rocks, and that's where we found our salp. <laughs> All right, so Kristen's going to go into a little bit more about the biology, but before we do, does anyone have any questions about the, those five main sites that, that we shared? You can put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. So in this picture, well, feel free to ask a question, but if no one's going to ask a question, I just, these are some of my favorite guidebooks. Um, I have every guidebook that you can get on the inner title and these are some of my favorites so um yeah so if you if you're don't know where to start this is a good place to start i I'm, I'm sure that bookshop santa cruz carries all of these books also um i don't know if the seymour center is still open with covid but the seymour center has these books that the monterey bay exploration center has these books so these are all good books okay so the inner tidal is divided into three major zones, the high zone, the mid zone, and the low zone. And the creatures that live there determine, you, that's how you know what zone you're in. And so, um, yeah, and so I'm just, I'm going to divide it into the high, mid, and low zone because that's people who talk about tide pools, that's how they talk about them. So in the high zone, um, there aren't as many species. So this is the upper limit of where marine species can hang out. And so up there, you have species that can hang out who are marine species who can hang out with sun beating down on them for hours. And so um, you can see barnacles um, in the high zone. You can also see limpets. Those are those, those sh sh snails that just sit flat on the rocks. And you can also see um, um, other kinds of snails. And um, how do they eat? How do these different creatures eat? And so barnacles are super cool in their larval stage. They float around and then when they land in the inner tidal, they actually glue their heads to the rocks. And what you see in this picture are their feet, which are getting food out of the water. And so they only eat at, when, the, when the tide's high. This next picture in the middle shows what um, uh, snails that are vegetarians do. They scrape the algae off the rock or they can eat bigger algae. And so all of those scrape marks, so that's the algae. And then all of these scrape marks that you see are the actual, the, the tongue of the limpets or the snails. And then that last snail is a predatory snail. Um, and it's actually going to drill its tooth into that limpet and eat it. I see a question. I see a hand up. What's your question? You got to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Do dog whales live here? Do dog whelks? Dog whelks. Whales. Do dog dog, dog whales? Whales. What is it, Eleanor? Kind of sea snail. Yeah. A kind of sea snail? Well, this the snail that you're seeing here, some people call those a dog whelk, which I think might be what you're talking about. But those, yeah, yeah. Those are the predatory snails. So you can see them in the high zone and the mid zone, and they're super cool because they eat barnacles and they eat mussels and they eat limpets, which is pretty awesome. Okay, so next picture. So this is now moving down into the mid zone. You can see that you see more, um, more species of algae and more invertebrates. I see mussels in this picture and green algae. It almost looks like moss. There are some rock weeds and all of that, um, stuff on the rocks that kind of looks like oil isn't oil it's actually one of the life stages of algae and so if you see that thick stuff growing on the rocks it's actually algae and not oil okay and so um there's a picture there of rock weeds and red algae and a great place to look for um invertebrates which are those animals without backbones is if you move aside the rock weeds you can look underneath and you can find snails and chitons and crabs all hiding there if you want to find crabs this looking under the algae is a great place to look and do you guys have any thoughts on why those creatures would live under the algae anyone have any ideas 
because, oh, you have, a, you, you have an answer. What is it? How they don't, so they don't get eaten? It's a good place to hide so they don't get eaten. And then I saw someone say shade. It's, it's not as hot there. And so it stays wetter and moister under the algae. And so at low tide, it's a really like moist place to live. Like, you know, when you're out in your yard, sometimes when it gets so hot, you go under the shade of the tree. Well, invertebrates go under the shade of the algae. Okay, and so um, sometimes when you're in the inner tidal, you might see a bare space and you wonder why doesn't anything live on that bare space? Well, this, the, um, John, if you can point out, that's an owl limpet, that's a really big limpet and it actually is a gardener and it clears that rock to grow microalgae and make sure that nothing else is there so it has a place where it can go eat. And then you can also in the mid zone, you can see mussels, which are the black creatures in this picture, and there are gooseneck farmers, which are white. And if you've ever wondered how they attach to rocks, um, they use these bissel threads. And so they have these sticky threads that go out and attach them to the rocks. And that's how they anchor themselves to the rocks. So, so people are asking, how is this talk associated to like the farm harvest festival? And it's because these things are farmers, they farm algae. <laughs> That's the whole reason. <laughs> That's how we made the connection and justified this talk to be at the Harvest Festival. <laughs> okay, um, so space is super limited in the inner tidal. Like there's just, there's a lot of animals that want to live there and there's not enough room for them all to live on rocks. And so they often, you can see them growing on themselves. And so this is a volcano barnacle happy because it's all alone in the world and it has room to feed. And then the other picture shows barnacles growing on it and algae growing on it. And yeah. Okay, so pools are great places to look for um, different creatures that live in the inner tidal. And so you can see a tide pool sculpin. And those guys are super camouflaged. Like I can be looking in a pool and not see one and my, my son will come up and he'll be like, mom, there are six of them in that pool. And so you can, this is a fun time to have a net. You can catch them, you can stick them in your little bucket and look at them and then put them back in that same pool. You can also see sunburst anemones. Um, and you can see those purple urchins that might be 70 years old. Um, and sometimes, and then in this picture it shows it, those urchins look like they're in little holes in the rocks. And basically in Santa Cruz, we have sandstone rocks and the urchins make something called a home scar. So they just live in the same place and they wait for drift algae to come so that they can eat it. And then basically the water moves around them and they just keep in the same place. And so they have, each of them has their own little hole to live in. And then the last, um, I have to, I study algae. I love algae. Um, the last, picture here is coralline algae. Um, it's often um, found in pools and um, it's not a coral, it's an algae, but it has calcium carbonate in its thallus, which makes it pink. So it's actually a red algae but because it has that calcium carbonate that's white. Um, it makes it look pink. And so someone just had a question. I saw it there for a second and it disappeared. Um, can urchins hurt you? Yes. I probably should have mentioned that before. Urchins have spines. Um, and if you fell on one or stepped on one, which my children have done before, they can, those spines can get in your feet, which is why you want to wear shoes in the inner tidal. Um, but if you, if you find one down in those holes, you can't pick them up. But if you find one just sort of sitting on the surface, you can pick them up. They're, purple urchins are pretty hardy and their, their um, spines don't break off very easily. So yeah. So be careful when you're touching urchins. And then what about anemones? Can you touch anemones? So you can touch anemones. Anemones actually have stinging tentacles that will that will sting um, whatever they want to eat. Um, and our fingers are tough, so we don't feel the stinging. But if you're curious on what that sting feels like, if you see an anemone that's a little bit out of the water, you could lick it and it will sting your tongue a little bit. And so um, I teach college kids and so there's always, I mean, you know, you have to, you have to keep people entertained. And so college kids um, spend a lot of time being like our big ones. Do they sting more than little ones? So there's a lot of college kids who are licking um, anemones to, to see the stinging, but you know, it's good to, someone said, now I have to lick one. I, you know, I, I, I think it's important. You gotta lick a banana slug. You gotta lick an urchin, it's, or not an urchin, don't lick urchins, an anemone. Okay. 
and, and do it. It's coming October 16th, 17th, and 18th. You'll find lots of anemones at any of these beaches. So I'm waiting for those dates because I've never kissed one yet. <laughs> okay. Um, next up, um, we're moving into the low zone. The low zone is my favorite. And so whenever I say, you know, you want to go when it's a zero tide, it's because you can get down to the low zone. And so the low zone, um, you can see in this picture, there's um, just a lot of cool algae. There's brown algae and red algae and green algae. Okay, next slide. Um, let's see, more pictures. Um, in the foreground here, um, this is surf grass. This is our one flowering plant that's found in tide pools. And so surf grass is a little bit of a misnomer. It's actually um, in the lily family. Um, and tropical surf grass actually has flowers that look like lilies. Our surf grass flowers are not that pretty, but that is our one flowering plant in the inner tidal. Um, and then everything else you see in the inner tidal um, is algae. Okay. Um, and so we live in Santa Cruz. Sometimes you go to the tide pools and there's a lot of sand and sometimes there isn't a lot of sand. So the top picture shows the same boulder, one exposed, one buried under sand. Um, and algae and invertebrates have different ways of dealing with being buried in sand. Like it's not so fun to be buried in sand. It's, you can't eat, you don't have any light. And so some species of algae will recover really quickly. So like they get scoured away and then they'll recruit and grow. And so that's one strategy. There are other algae that basically get buried and they kind of, I don't know, lack of a better word, hibernate until they're unburied and then they can photosynthesize again. And you'll sometimes see anemones in the sand and they're actually just reaching up through the sand, through, they're on a rock reaching up through the sand and they can, they can survive quite some time without food. Okay. So, dun, da, da, da. nudibranchs. This is one of the coolest things you can find in the inner tidal. Nudibranchs, sea slugs. Um, nudibranch mean, means naked gills. And so they can be found in low pools and surf grass beds. Um, Pigeon Point and Greyhound Rock are great places to look for them. And they are absolutely beautiful. I mean, you can get a whole book on the different ones. And so, um, they, <laughs> I didn't even know they had common names because I know all their scientific names. So, Hermacinda. Um, is really gorgeous. It doesn't have a common name and it's shown there with its eggs. So the eggs sort of look like a flower in the inner title. Um, Hopkins, Hopkins Rose, um, you can see it more these days. It is a, a southern species that in warm water events um, you see more along our coast and with climate change and warming waters we're getting more of the Hopkins Rose. Um, yeah, so Nudibranchs are incredible and you would think that something hot pink you would see it but sometimes you just don't and so you really got to get down low and look for these these different creatures. And how how big are these like on a scale of inches or feet what are they? Um they're they're little they're you know um sorry inches like an inch I I, I don't think in inches about an inch <laughs> smaller than an inch yeah they're pretty yeah. little. You really got you really got to look around and just kind of part the seagrass and the kelp and just just stay in one area and look around and then when you see the Hopkins rose you just can't miss it because they're just so vibrant. Um, and yeah, I I've, I've been in tide pools. I was at a and I was looking at a tide pool um, at close to Scott Creek and I looked in one pool and there were like fifteen Hermesinda. It was the weirdest thing. I've never seen somebody. I think they must have come together to mate. I think I saw a mating aggregation. And then I looked in all the other pools around and there weren't any. They had all moved to one pool. So you could be really lucky and see a bunch in one place. This kind of reminds me like when you go to the Sierras and you're lucky enough to see a bear. It's kind of like that. You know, you're looking, looking, looking. Oh, look, there they are. Okay, um, I know we're, we're running, I mean, how much time, I, I, we're, we're getting close to the end. Okay, so. Yeah, we're getting close to the end. Getting, more okay, yeah. um, and so these are just some pictures of different crabs you can find in the inner tidal. Um, cancer crabs are really big crabs. They tend to be low in pools. And so those are the ones that you, in the picture in the beginning, the boys were catching with nets. Um, they're in low pools. Kelp crabs, um, they spend their juvenile time in the inner tidal and they're red, and then they actually move offshore to kelp and turn brown. 
Um, hermit crabs are in every pool. They're super fun to look at. Um, line shore crabs are found higher up um, in the intertidal and then decorator crabs are very sneaky. And I'm gonna tell a quick story about line shore crabs and then I'll get your question. But when my son was about two years old, I found this line shore crab and I stuck it in his little two year old hands and I picked a crab that was a little bigger than I probably should have handed him and it pinched him. And um, Wiley threw his hand because he got pinched. It was scary. And the crab went flying and the pincher stayed attached to his finger. And he was crying and sobbing. I was feeling like a terrible mom. And I'm like, poor Wiley, poor Wiley. And Wiley like stopped crying and looked at me. He was like, not poor Wiley, poor crabby. He felt so bad that he had dismembered a crab. But I told him that the crab had a great story and he would regrow his claw and it would all be okay. Okay, I saw a question. Do you still have a question? What was your question? You said you were gonna show an octopus with a beak. I am, it's, I, it might be the next picture. It's coming really soon. You Let's see, is it the next? Oh, not yet, it'll come, I'll show you. Okay, so um, these are, we already showed you the picture of the anemones. So anemones, um, they, their tentacles sting. Um, they, so the top ones are the sunburst anemones, the bottom ones are colonial anemones. They're different, they're, they're both the same genus, but different species. And the colonial anemones, all of those could be the same genetic individual. And anemones can actually, one anemone can become two anemones just by pulling itself apart, which is crazy. And sometimes if you see an anemone with white tentacles instead of these green tentacles, and they're kind of more bulbous. Those are anemones that are fighting and it's like a slow motion war. And that will happen between two that are unrelated. You would never see that with these um, colonial anemones. And then the picture over here is just what the anemones look like when they're closed. And they'll often be covered in sand. They cover themselves in sand so they don't dry out. But, but you will just be walking along and not realize that you're walking on anemones and then you step on them and all the water squirts out. And they will be okay, but yeah, just walk gently in the inner tidal. Um, sea stars, sea stars have been having a hard time recently and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide, but the top two pictures are the ochre sea star. Um, they're different color morphs, so they can be purple or orange. They're not, they're the same species, like a mama sea star could have, I don't know, a hundred purple ones and a hundred orange ones. Um, and then at the bottom, there's the leather star. Leather stars, you can also see they're kind of more slimy. And because they don't have that really strong skeleton, um, they actually, if, if a creature tries to eat them, they will exude um, a garlic smell. And so if you're out in the inner town and you find a leather star, they're super smooth. But if you rub it a little bit hard and then smell it, it'll smell like garlic. It's kind of crazy. And then there are bat stars and then the little six armed sea star, which are like the size of a quarter. And so when you're looking for nudibranchs, keep your eyes out for the six armed starfish. The adults are about the size of a quarter and the babies are like the cutest little things you've ever seen in your life. They're teeny tiny. Okay, so sea stars. Um, this is really sad. Um, you know, a lot of things, a lot of things, um, we've caused a lot of problems in the ocean, humans have, and oceans are getting warmer. And sea stars, um, a few years back, there was a, a combination of events that happened. There was a really warm water and a disease broke out. Um, and so it's called sea star wasting disease. And this is a picture of a sick star. And so if you happen to see a sick star, a sick sea star in the inner tidal, don't touch it because you could actually spread the disease. We're all super familiar with diseases these days. So, you know, you don't want to touch a sick star. And, you know, this is, Davenport Landing used to have this, the picture with all those stars is actually taken up in Oregon. But um, Davenport Landing, when you would go there, you used to see like 100 stars in a day. And now you'll see five or six. And so um, we're not sure if those ones just never got the disease or are disease resistant. But sea stars, at least the ochre sea stars are doing, are, are making a comeback. You'll see baby ones in the inner tidal. It's pretty exciting. Um, some of the subtitle species are not doing as well. Okay, and dun, 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 dun. chitons. Chitons are um, another really cool mollusk. They have those eight plates along their back. Um, the lined chiton is found down low in pools, 
pink and blue, absolutely beautiful. The gumbu chitin, you can find, um, you can find, sorry, um, you can find also in the low zone. And if you ever have found shells that look like um, butterflies, those are actually the plates on its back. Um, and they're actually, the scientific name is cryptochitona. So it's like the hidden chitin. And then tunicates. I, you know, if you see that weird gelatinous slime that kind of looks like Aboriginal art, those are tunicates. Um, and they basically have an in-current siphon, an ex-current siphon. They're like a sponge. Um, but there's the stock tuna kit, and then I don't know. Did, I can't see the the other the colonial tuna kit. I don't think it even has a common name. I think I just was like, it's a colonial tuna kit. Okay. Um, dun, da, 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 here's your octopus. So red octopus, um, their juveniles are found in tide pools, and so you might get to see a small baby red octopus. Um, that bottom picture is perfect octopus habitat. And so you're going to be in the low zone. If you see a cobbly pool with dead things in it, like some shells in it, look around. There's, there's an octopus right there, which is pretty camouflaged. Um, and so my recommendation is if you see a low pool like this, just sit down there for a second, look around, see if you see any tentacles coming out or move a few rocks, see if you can find an octopus. And then this other picture is the octopus's beak. And so how do octopus eat things? They have this hard beak that actually will, will come out and eat things. And so that's what can cut you on an octopus. And I remember a day where a friend of mine, we were, I was in college, we were in class and he found an octopus and he picked it up and he was like, oh my gosh, I found an octopus. And the professor of the class was like, put it down. And he didn't say it in time. And he got this nasty cut on his finger. So it can cut you like a knife. It's pretty intense. Um, OK, and I am a phycologist. I study algae. I teach marine botany. And so I had to give um, at least one algae slide. Algae is incredible, amazing diversity um, across the top, well, on the, the the three on the right are red algal species and you have a green, the two middle ones are green and then the bottom right is um, brown algae. Um, but one of the cool things about um, the mozzarella, the blade that looks a little bit iridescent in the, the bottom left corner, that one, when you're looking in pools, it's pretty magical. You'll see it flash this red and blue color and, and it's, it's something that the algae has evolved over time and they think that it might help the algae scare um, fish away from eating it. Okay, and then this is important. There are some protected species. Um, so even if you're at places that aren't um, marine protected areas, um, these three species are protected. So one of them is black abalone. It is an endangered species. It's actually the only invertebrate on the endangered species list. Um, black abalone, um, had a disease that wiped out a lot of them. Um, they were also, people also eat abalone, so that was part of it, but then they also got hit with um, a disease. And so you could see black abalone down deep and under rocks, um, kind of tucked away. They want to stay away from otters because otters really like to eat abalone. Um, the sea palm, which is a brown algae, it's a kelp, is also protected. It is super yummy to eat. Um, and people um, need to get special permits in order to harvest the blades and they harvest them at a certain time of year so that they can reproduce. Um, but if you see a sea palm, you don't, you're not allowed to pick it, you're not allowed to touch it. And if you see a sea palm, you probably don't actually want to be in the intertidal where you are because sea palms only grow where it's really rough. So if you end up on an offshore rock with sea palms, um, yeah, you want to just be aware of waves. And then um, the last picture is the surf grass, and that is a protected species also. So you don't want to you don't want to rip up anything, but you especially don't want to rip up seagrass. Um, yeah. And then there was a question about um, invasive species. Um, luckily, in the intertidal, it's such a harsh environment that there aren't that many invasive species that have made it in the intertidal. Um, but I did want to show you two algal species that are invasive in the intertidal um, and then the native species that they look like. And so it's one of those things that you probably, it, it's, it's pretty tricky to identify, but so yeah. So um, 
So we have Sargassum muticum, I think the common name is wireweed, and then Stephanocystis is the native species, and then Colacanthus is the non-native species, and then it looks a lot like Endocladia. So yeah, so there are some invasive species, but yeah, and with that, I am done with everything I wanted to say, and I'm ready to answer any questions. And this is, um, this is just a picture, those lines that are in the inner title, um, those are transect lines. This is part of um, the biodiversity study that I was doing at the university. And this was the most slippery site that I've ever been to in my life. And I don't know how many times I went from standing upright to flat on my back. It was just super slippery. This is up um, in Canada. So with that, I will take any questions. Oh, and it's 802. We rock. So does anyone have any questions about anything? Are there any in the chat that I need to look at? I don't see any. And I'm putting in the map link if you do want the map to go to those. Oh, yeah. And so someone asked anemones dangerous to touch. They aren't dangerous to touch unless you touch them with your tongue. And then they can be a little bit dangerous. But um, yeah, I. It, it's pretty, I mean, my kids love to stick their fingers in anemones and have the anemone grab onto it and then pull their fingers out. Um, Eleanor, you had your hand up. What were you guys just talking about? You, you were frozen, so we couldn't hear you. Oh, well, I saw in the chat, someone asked if urchins and anemones were dangerous. And I did urchins, you can get urchin spines in you. And then anemones, they're not really dangerous. And it's actually... You probably would like this. When you're out in the inner tidal, you can poke them and they'll think that you're a fish and they'll try to eat you. And then you can pull your I finger do. back out. That's what I do. It's fun. See, I, I do it too. It's totally fun. It's one of the, the inner tidal is just fun. Like everything about the inner tidal is fun. It's fun to fall. It's fun to look for things. It's fun to dig through the algae and find things. So I'm glad that you go there and have fun. And maybe someday. Oh, unless there's anemones next to you. Then you don't want to fall? Urchins, urchins. I mean, urchins, yeah. You don't want to fall on urchins. Definitely not. Eleanor, would you kiss an anemone? I, I'm going to kiss an anemone the next time I see one. No, no? it's, it's pretty dangerous. Um, yeah, so and maybe, you know, I do go tide pooling all the time with my kids. And so if you ever see me out there, come say hi. And if you have any questions, um, you, you can ask me questions. And actually, I probably I can put my email in the chat. If you ever out in the tide pools and you see something you don't know what it is, you can send me a picture and I can identify it for you. So I'll add my email to the chat. Oh, wait, don't misspell it. Okay, well, there it is. And if, and if you lose my email, you can always, I, I teach at the university, so if you can remember my name, you can find my email that way too. Yeah, thank you so much, Kristen, for sharing all that knowledge. And uh, she could have oh. spoken for three hours on all that stuff. And so it was great to uh, get the family version of, of all these animals and creatures. And, um, you know, another reason we do this, or I wanted to do this as part of Life Lab's, you know, mission is cultivating children's love of nature. And, um, this is just one area of nature that you can only explore six to eight days a month. Um, but it's really, really special if you can find a negative one tide or below. Um, it's just. And do you know what? Every time you go to the beach, even if it's not an epic low tide, like sometimes if the, if the swell is small, it might not even be that great of a tide, but it might be an amazing exploration. Um, last year on my birthday, I went out and I was not planning to go tide pooling. And that's when I found all of those nudibranchs in one pool because I was like, wait, the tides are, I can go out and play. So, and we were, we, we actually went out barefoot, which was a little bit dangerous. So you should always wear shoes in the tide pools. Um, where can I get a tide chart? That was ask your mom. That was from my kids. Um, where can you get a tide chart? So you can download an app um, to get one, or you can go to any of your local surf shops and they have these little books that will tell you about the tides. Um, 
Yeah, if you just Google, if you just if you just Google Santa Cruz tides, they it, it will come up also. So, yeah. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, we're gonna um, end our presentation. And it looks like Eleanor might be interested in in sharing something. To say thank you. Um, once my, me and my mom studied seaweed. You did? What did you study? You nature journaled after we went to the went to natural bridges and we saw so many different beautiful ones and we came home, got out our guides. We put the seaweed in a bucket journaled. and put water with it for the seaweed so we could study it. You know what I should have mentioned, and I forgot to mention this, but one of my favorite things to do when I go tide pooling is just to walk along the beach before I actually go tide pooling or after I go tide pooling. And there's all that algae that gets washed up on shore. And that's the algae that I feel really happy about taking some of it home and identifying it. You can also, if you have a plant press, you can press that algae and make beautiful works of art. Um, I don't have any hanging behind me, but I love pressing algae. It, it's beautiful. So I'm glad that you liked seeing the algae and that you wrote about it because I think it's the cool. I mean, I still have, are, oh, what? I still have a page in my book that shows the different things that I studied. Awesome. Can I'm I, glad. I, oh, yep. Sorry, I, we keep interrupting you. I was just going to say we collected some of the seaweed that was floating we were kind of swimming. We went down to natural bridges and went off to the left, like towards the south. Uh -huh. And it was just amazing right around there. Um, and then we collected some that were floating in, around in the water. Is that, we just put, we just brought some home. Is that okay? Or is it not okay to take it out of the water? Um, it wasn't that's okay. attached to anything. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you, being at natural bridges, that's a state park and they, oh, right. they right. will get mad at you. Like yeah. that is one place that they will get mad at you. But I, I mean, collecting drift algae is probably like the least, the, it, it, there's so, I mean, you know, you live in Santa Cruz after these storms that hit, there's algae everywhere. If you take some of that algae, it's not going to affect anything. Like it's, yeah. So, so that, that is the you. best way to collect. But I mean, I, I love pressing algae. Like I, my students press algae in the marine botany class that I teach and I always encourage them to, to collect drift algae. But if you think about the seasonality of algae, like, you know, in the spring it's growing and it gets all big and beautiful. And then the, the winter storms hit and it all gets pushed up on the beaches. And yes, it's part of, you know, you know, they're all those creatures that eat the drift algae, but there's a lot of it. So yeah, so that is a great, I highly recommend collecting drift algae. I mean, walking that, it's called walking the rack line. I mean, it's one of the most amazing things. And you can see so many cool subtitle species that get thrown onto the shore. Thank you. And my child That's wanted beautiful. to, my, my child just delivered this. It's, it's, it's a little oh, bit faded. Look at that. But there's a pressing. It's, it's actually, and this is the other thing. Algae is very, um, it's an ephemeral art. Like it, it's beautiful and then it fades away. Oh, and then here's another one. Thank you. So These did you, just... so how did you do this? Um, so I have, that's I a... have, isn't that this, this is, this is one of my that's favorites. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. So that's, um, that's the, the giant kelp. Yeah. Um, I have a big plant press. Wait, are they pulling in more? Um, I have a, I actually have an algae plant press. And so I have a plant press that's, that's that big for pressing algae. But if you, um, yeah, so if you can make one. You can make one. Yeah, you can totally make one. And there's herbarium supply companies where you can buy sheets. But um, what you do is you just a piece of paper and then you put um, what's the best thing to do is you do a piece of paper and then the algae and then like an old t shirt, something cotton so that the algae doesn't stick to it. Or you can take wax paper and then crumple it up and put it on top and then put newspaper on each side of it and then press it between books. That would work too. Um, Great. And then that color on that print was just from the seaweed, no paint, no nothing. Oh, just from the seaweed. That's yeah. amazing. And with the red algae, I wish I had, I mean, I could probably grab with red algae. It starts out absolutely beautiful and then it fades. The, the brown, that, that brown algae, I have no idea why it still has color. Like I think it might've stained the paper, beautiful. but yeah, algae pressing is definitely a, a fun activity. Nice. And I just found the tide chart that you use, John, on your Android. I found it on my iPhone just so everybody knows.
Oh, great. Yeah, I, I like that. I've used a lot of different ones and I like that one just because it's so visual and you can check day by day. But yeah, I think the most important thing is to find those dates ahead of time and put them on your normal calendar so that you know to go out, you know, don't forget because there's only and so many days in a month. Yeah, and my kids, like when there's a good Tide series, like we go out three and four days in a row and it gets to the point where they're like, we don't want to go Tide pooling. I'm like, no, we have to, it's amazing. Um, but yeah, and it's just every, I mean, if you go to the same place day after day, you will find different things. And I think that's the part about the Tide pools that I absolutely love. I mean, I've been studying this for 20 plus years and I can still go out to the Tide pools and find something that I've never seen before. I mean, you know, finding a species of algae that I'm like, what is this? Um, yeah, so my family's coming in and out of a kelp forest there. I <laughs> know, I like that. Okay. okay. Um, any other questions? We'll see and, you, see you yeah. in the top pools. Thank you, Kristen, and thanks for those of you who hung on to, to learn more. And I challenge you all to go to a new beach. If you haven't been to some of those we mentioned, go find a new beach. Or, all right, I'm gonna say goodbye. Oh, got my kids are cute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.